welcome. This is our Young Naturalist Lunch and Learn. Um, we've been doing these for uh, about a month now. Um, now that we're in the digital format with everything, trying to still bring everybody some, some fun things to do and learn about um, watersheds and nature. So today we have our guest is Jacqueline Briggs Martin. She is, um, hopefully you can see her picture there on the side too. I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen so that she can introduce herself and you'll see a bigger picture of all of us. There she is. Okay. So hi Jacqueline. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm so happy that you're spending your time with us and um, I have my copy of the book here. I just think it's great. So yeah, welcome. Do you want to just say a little bit about yourself? And Sure. Um, I am so glad to be here with you to talk about this book, Creek Finding, which is the story of one creek that was lost and found. And uh, I think, shall I just go ahead and talk for a bit, Aurora? Is that? Yeah. Um, I mean, do you want to, it's up to you. Do you want to jump right into the book or do you want to talk about the, the writing of the book first? I think I'll talk about the writing of the book. And then I'll read the story. Sure. I wanted to talk a little bit about where writers get ideas for the stories that they write. Um, I think sometimes people think, oh, if you're a writer, it's really easy. You just reach up, pull down an idea, write it down, and you're done. But that's not true. Writers think about what they want to write about. And I think what writers choose to write about is what they think like thinking about what they care about. I care about being outdoors. I grew up on a farm in Maine, which is way up in the northeast part of the country, further east and further north than Pennsylvania. I now live in Iowa, which is in the middle part of the country, just west of the Mississippi River. But on that farm in Maine, we had Holstein cows, and we had a lot of fields and woods around our house. And I loved spending time walking in those woods, walking down the lane through the fields to the woods. So as an adult who is writing stories, I am drawn to write stories about the outdoors. I bet there's something that every one of you loves. Maybe it's riding your bike, maybe it's playing basketball or baseball. Maybe it's cooking. As you are doing writing for your school or just for fun for you, think about the things that you love and see how you can write about the things that you love. I am always looking for stories about outdoors because I love the outdoors. Well, a few years ago, I saw this newspaper. I hope you can see it. Am I holding it so you can all see it? It I says, man-made miracle. Luther Grad restores a stream, creates a refuge for native Iowa trout. I was just sitting at home drinking my coffee, reading the newspaper. And I read that story and I thought, I want to make a book out of this story. I want kids to know about how this man found this creek. So I talked with him. He told me how he worked for years to do this. And once he had it done, they put some baby trout in and they lived. And they're still there having babies and growing up and having more babies. It's a great place for trout. And so, I wanted to write about it, and I did. And this is the book. And now I would like to read that story to you. Great. Okay. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna I'm gonna share my screen. I love that you shared um, just how you were inspired. That anybody, you know, you see something that inspires you, a, a news article or something outside, and just go for it. I'm gonna bring this up here so we can see a big picture of the pages here. Oh, okay. Let me go back one. This is just a map. Um, just to give you an idea, she, Jacqueline said she is in Iowa, and that's that red state right in the middle 
of our country. So it might be blocked. It's, for my computer, it's blocked by the pictures unless I move it. But I think a lot of I us know in yeah, Pennsylvania, yeah. Um, we are where that star is. That's where we are. And then there's Iowa there. Okay, so I'm now going to go. There's the cover of our book. And this one is a true story, like Jacqueline just said. So we're going to jump right in here. The Creek Finding Machine. An excavator is a machine that chomps dirt. Excavators dig holes for basements, trenches for water pipes, paths for roads. Sometimes excavators help find lost creeks. How do they do that? How does a creek get lost? Especially a creek that started long ago with a spring that burbled out of the ground and tumbled itself across a prairie valley. The creek wasn't just water. Insects whirred in and around the creek. Brook trout grew fat in the creek, lunching on insects. Frogs chirruped by the creek, ready for their buggy share. Birds watched at the stream side, hungry for bugs, fish, or frogs. And on this little blade of grass, let's see, right here it says the frogs, spring peepers, leopard frogs, pickerel frogs, and green frogs. And over here it names the insects, stoneflies, dragonflies, and caddisflies. I love those little words incorporated into the picture. I do too. That was Claudia's idea. And she did such a wonderful job of having it there, but having it not um, interrupt the text. Well, the creek did not lose itself. A farmer used a bulldozer to stuff the creek with dirt so he would have space to grow more corn. No water, no water bugs, no frogs, no birds, and no brook trout. The Lost Creek was quiet under the sun. This, this page just amazes me. I had no idea that people would fill in a creek um, like this. So this was a new idea for me and a new understanding. It's really, you know, the creek was in the way and he wanted to farm. That's right. So what he did, it's a spring-fed creek, so the water keeps coming up out of the ground. He redirected it around the edge of his field. So he had a watery ditch around the edge of his field, but where the creek used to be became cornfield. Trout in a cornfield. Years later, a man named Mike bought that field and the hillside. Mike wanted to grow a prairie in the old cornfield to partner with the sun and soil grow tall grasses and flowers. One day, as Mike was out working, a neighbor came by and said that long ago, he had caught a brook trout in that very spot. A brook trout in a cornfield? No way. Partnering with the creek. Mike knew there must have been a creek on that prairie. He wanted to find the creek make a place for brook trout, birds, bugs, and frogs. He said he would call it Brook Creek. Others laughed, said Mike's plan was foolishness. Lost is lost. And the map that Mike is holding is the real aerial map that he found. Claudia shrunk it so that she could actually put it in her illustration. Wow. Someone gave him an old photograph, and this is the old photograph. I and never noticed that. It. Pardon me? I did not notice that until you pointed it out. Yeah, it looks real once you know that, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. It does. Someone gave him an old photograph, and he marked the creek's path. Then he called his friends who owned big machines, and you can see the flags that he put down from the map to mark the creek's path. Scraping and digging. 
For five days, a bulldozer scraped, an excavator bit into the ground, carved holes, dug curves and runs, tamped rocks for the creek bottom. The excavator had found the old stream. Would water fill the path? Mike said the water remembered. It seeped in from the sides, raced down the riffles and runs, burbled into holes, filled the creek. He said as soon as he finished digging, as soon as that excavator finished digging, the water just came swooshing in. But a creek isn't just water. It's plants, rocks, bugs, fish, and birds. Mike and his friends, so once they had the creek bed, just where it used to be, Mike and his friends planted cordgrass and other green shoots into the creek banks. For three summers, grasses grew. When the creek bed needed more rocks, Mike had a problem. Heavy trucks crossing to the creek would press deep ruts into the ground, kill new prairie plants. How could he get more rocks to the creek? And so down there on the bottom, it says small rocks protect the soil under the stream bed and are home to many tiny plants and creatures. Yeah, if anyone was with us in um, some of our previous webinars, you know that if you were there for creek critters, you might remember that the water bugs live under rocks. So that's a very important part of the stream. He thought about it. This is not part of the text, but I will just tell you that Mike thought about it and thought about it. And one night he woke up in the middle of the night and he knew what to do. He knew to wait until the ground was frozen. Mike waited until winter. When the ground was frozen hard, cement trucks lumbered across the prairie, emptied their rocks into the creek, and left no ruts. And over here, this is a question that a lot of people asked him, so we put it in the book. Why not use dump trucks to haul rocks? Mike didn't want to just dump the rocks in the creek. Cement trucks have chutes, so he could put the rocks exactly where the creek needed them. Such a great idea in the winter. I know, isn't that wonderful? It really is. Rocks settled in, plants grew, insects flew in, whirred and buzzed and laid eggs in the water and on the grasses. After two more years, small fish called sculpin swam into the creek, and that was good news. Sculpin survive only in clean, clear water, the same kind of water that brook trout need. And here is a little sculpin. So Mike didn't really need the sculpin, but he did need to know what kind of water he had, and he was very glad to see the sculpin. On the next page, Claudia did a map. Claudia McGeehy is an illustrator, and she did a map. And here you see Mike's house in the middle, and then the creek that he made, the uh, spring-fed stream is up by the road where the red pickup truck is. So that's where the creek starts, right? here, yeah, right there, comes down, 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 and then goes into this other creek. Where, and I wanted to tell you where the sculpin come from. Where did the sculpin come from? Sculpin survived in the small space up here where the creek starts at the head of the spring. They swam into Brook Creek from right up there where the creek starts. Time for trout. A pickup truck carried the tub that held the trout. Mike and his friends laughed in the morning air, lugged and dumped buckets of finger-sized fish. 
Perhaps Brook, Brook Creek laughed too, tickled by trout. Now because the creek water comes up from the ground from that spring, the temperature stays just about the same all year round. Feels warm in the winter, cool in the summer. Just what little trout need. Water was right, food was right. Trout snapped up bugs and grew for two summers. In the second fall, the rocks proved perfect places for the fish to lay eggs. Brook trout actually change color during the egg laying season. Their under parts, their bellies, become bright red and orange. And then down here, Claudia made some sketches that show exactly how they do it. The female trout uses tail fins to scoop out a little bowl in the gravelly creek bottom. Then she releases 15 to 60 eggs the size of green peas. The male trout swims past and fertilizes the eggs. Then the female uses that fin to cover the eggs with gravel and swims on to do it again. So she just leaves them there. Winter came. This, this picture is so beautiful. I love this picture and it, how it captures the night and it's a completely different colors. It's my favorite picture in the entire book. I love this picture. Is too. it? Winter came. Would the eggs survive? Snowstorm, ice storm, cold wind. Then, late one winter morning, fish squiggles, no longer than a thumbnail. Look at your thumbs, kids. Imagine a tiny little fish the size of your thumbnail. Isn't that amazing to think? That's the size they are when they hatch out of the eggs. And it's, um, it's like in late February. So Mike probably wasn't out very often checking out the creek because it would be very cold or the weather would be very cold. The creek would be the same temperature. But there were those tiny little fish the size of our thumbnails. Squiggles grew into fat trout who laid eggs in turn to hatch more generations of trout at home in Brook Creek. Maybe a chuckle, maybe a thanks. If you went to the creek with Mike, you'd see the water. But a creek isn't just water. You'd see brook trout and sculpin. You'd hear the outdoor orchestra, herons, snipe, bluebirds, yellow throat warblers. Frogs returned home and insects, thousands and thousands and thousands of insects. When I first read this story, I wondered how did all these animals find their way back? I read that all the kinds of frogs in Iowa found that creek in the middle of that prairie. And I thought, how did they find it? How did they know it was there? Because it didn't used to be there. So that was part of my research was figuring out how all these animals came back to the creek. How did the birds find the creek? Mike thinks they found it while flying around looking for new food. How did the frogs find the creek? Frogs explore during rains. And perhaps they found Brook Creek on one of their wet wanderings. There are other creeks nearby. So maybe they came from those other creeks, kind of wandered through that wet prairie and found Brook Creek. You'd hear the water ripple and burble, maybe a chuckle, maybe a thanks to Mike and the big machines that found the creek. The Thank end. you. I love this story. Um, I was wondering now that we just ended with thanking Mike, um, if we could, if you could maybe tell us who Mike is, because he's a real person. Mike is a real person. He loves his creek, and he worked so hard to restore it. And I want to, I want to tell you who he is, but I want to read something that he wrote that's in the very back of the book. 
This is Mike's writing. As a kid, I loved exploring the creeks and caves around my home. As an adult, once I heard there had been a spring-fed creek in that valley, finding it and restoring it became my dream. I believed we could do it. There were a lot of naysayers. Naysayers, you probably know, are people who say, nay, no, you can't do it. That'll never work. You can't do it. So Mike says there were a lot of naysayers, but the science part of my brain said if the stream flowed once, it could flow again. And the nature loving part of my brain said, wouldn't it be wonderf a wonderful gift to bring back these trout that had lived in Iowa for thousands of years? There are now very few places in Iowa where brook trout can survive. I wanted to help make a place where they would be able to thrive for generations to come. And this is the, the most important thing to Mike, I think. Restoring Brook Creek reminds all of us, kids too, that dreams do come true and that our dreams make a difference. We can restore parts of our world that have been lost or degraded. I hope kids will remember from this story that we can change the world by acting on our dreams. I wish Mike were here to say that to you himself because that's so important to him. Now, the other thing that Mike does, this is kind of his hobby, his big hobby. He is a public health officer and infectious diseases, pandemics like we are in now with the coronavirus, those are his specialty. He knows a lot about them. He's traveled all over the world studying pandemics, helping areas that have an outbreak of an infectious disease. So you may have seen him on television in these past few months because a lot of television news programs interview him to see what he can tell us that would be helpful. And of yeah, course, I've, one thing I've, said, I've seen him on the news. That's right. Yeah, I've seen him interviewed. I've seen him quoted in many articles. He's very busy these days. <laughs> he really is. Yes. But I have told him how many people are reading Creek Finding right now. I emailed him a couple of weeks ago and said I was doing this Zoom and that other people are reading Creek Finding and finding it hopeful. And he emailed me right back and said, that makes me so happy. I think he wanted to bring this creek back to health as a project of happiness to kind of balance out all the sickness that he has to deal with. Um, so yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I love that. Um, it, it, I love that, you know, this wasn't his full time job to do this. It was a very big project, but, you know, he specializes in public health. He has a very, um, you know, demanding career. He's written books and, as you said, is interviewed all the time and travels. And yet um, he still had this passion for this creek and restoring the environment on this property. And I guess it, to me, it just shows you don't have to be a park ranger or a wetlands ecologist, or you know, you don't have to have a career in, in the environment to make a difference. Um, you know, it can be something you do in addition to something else. And we can all do that. Right. And when he was doing, um, planting the grass by the sides of the creek or some of the other things that he had to do, moving the rocks around. He had a lot of volunteer friends. So a lot of times you can make a difference by helping out on a project that's already ongoing. He couldn't have done this all alone. He had to have the help of his friends. That's a really good message. Um, I think we were going to talk a little bit about the illustrations. I know when I first picked up this book, it really caught my eye because the illustrations are so different from, you know, many other books that I've seen. Um, and they're really beautiful. And so I thought, I wonder how they were done. They must be done in a different way, not, you know, like watercolor or sketch. It was something different. Um, so I wondered if any, anyone on the call had any ideas about how these sketches were done before we, we reveal how they were actually done by the illustrator. Does anyone want to share any idea? You know, do you think it could be um, painting, chalk, markers? What do you think? Does it, 
I see a lot of dark lines in here. And so I knew it was something interesting and different. Any ideas? I think I see Amelia. Can you unmute yourself and share? Um, I think it's colored pencils. Colored pencils? Okay. I think I see, is that another hand? That's a lot of beautiful colors, doesn't it? Colored pencils is a good guess. I thought I saw another hand, maybe not. Okay. A couple oh, of here hands. It is. Sorry, Hi, I have to Schrader. Yes, there we go. Daniel. Is it markers, maybe? It could be markers. I could see how someone could use markers for this. Yeah, maybe. It could be like a computer design. A computer? That's another good guess. A lot of books are illustrated with computers too these days. Okay, well, let's find out. So there is a picture of the illustrator. And Jackie, you know Claudia. I do. Claudia and I have been friends for a long time. And when I read the newspaper article that I showed you earlier that gave me the idea for this book, I thought, I want to write this story and I want my friend Claudia to illustrate it. And fortunately, she loved the story too and wanted to draw the pictures for it. That's so wonderful. And I just love, um, I was so interested in the art process. There's a really good um, interview by Bookology Magazine. And I'm going to share it all with you guys after this webinar. I'll email it out if you're interested in finding out more. But just to briefly tell you how it works, she used something called a scratch board um, up here. See that? that black and she has a little exacto blade um, and she scratches away at the black to reveal that that picture does that remind you of anything i'm thinking my kids have art supplies that are similar to this it's not called a scratch board though um, does that remind anyone of um, scratch art has anyone done scratch art here it's basically the same idea but it doesn't have the white background usually there's Often there's colors and things like that. But then she had to get the color in there, right? So she, once she had it all scratched out, she scans that into the computer. So there was a computer element there and then printed it onto watercolor paper. So now she has her, her black and white art and she can watercolor over it to add all the colors. Um, I find that process fascinating and I, I kind of wanted to try to replicate that myself, to be honest. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to send out some information. If anyone wants to try that, um, we can kind of do some, some things that are similar to that to get that same art process at home. And then Jack, Jackie, you had said that there was some collaboration during her art process. Yes, because I know Claudia, and because she lives about 20 miles from where I live, very close, I can go see her. And I did as we were working on the illustrations for this book. And the one on the left, this one, was an early illustration that she, well, not early because it's all colored in and all scratched away. But we looked at it and this is where the creek is all filled in. No water, no water bugs, no frogs, no birds. The Lost Creek was quiet under the sun. And then we looked and we saw this little bit of writing. Brook Creek can't live in a ditch. They can't live in a mud puddle. And as much as I like telling readers that they need clean water, they can't live in a ditch or a mud puddle, I thought that patch of writing really interfered with the way that the, the field was so quiet with no birds, no bugs, no frogs. It, it just seemed cluttered to me. And I asked Claudia if we could take it out. And she said, sure, we could. And I like it much better without that writing. I think it looks quieter and lonelier and... Um, yeah, it, it captures the essence of what you, what you wrote there. That's right, quiet yeah. under the sun. Yeah. That's great. I love to, to hear about the process with the collaboration and how you work together to, 
to make the vision what what you both wanted it to be. Um, yeah, I felt really lucky that I could see that in time to remove it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I just before I wanted to talk a little bit how streams get lost and maybe talk about in our area. But before I do that, I want to see if anyone has questions for our author. Um, anything about Brook Creek or Mike or the process of writing or, you know, anything about what we've talked about today. If anyone has a question, you can send it to the chat or I can scroll through your pictures here and see if anyone is raising their hand. Any questions? No, nope, doesn't look like we have any questions. So um, I have a question for you, for you then. Maybe before we go to that, I could tell the kids about Max or did you want to do Max? Oh, yeah, sure. We can do that. Um, I need, let me go back to our slide that has, well, let's see, Max is in two places. He's on the cover and then also- Yeah, we can do, yeah, we can- here. Um, Yes. Um, so Max is the dog, right? Max is the dog. And I told you that Mike has this other job. So he could only go down to Brook Creek and his farm, Prairie Song Farm, on weekends. And he would get up on Saturday morning, put on his work clothes. And he said, when the dog Max saw his work clothes, he got so excited because he knew they were going to Brook Creek. And Max, loved Brook Creek. Max was a wonderful dog. He would sit in the creek while Mike fished. Mike life, loves to do catch and release trout fishing. And Max would sit in the creek or sit by the edge of the creek and watch him. Well, before Claudia had finished the illustrations, Max suddenly got sick and he didn't survive being sick. He died. And Mike was so sad because Max was his dog. He called me up and said, Jackie, do you think Claudia can put Max in the book? He has died and he loved Brook Creek and I would love to have him in the book. Well, fortunately, Claudia had not quite finished the illustrations. So she put Max in this picture at the end and if you look on the cover, you will see Max is on the cover too. And that made me and Claudia so happy that we could still include Max in the book. So even though Max is no longer living, whenever anybody sees this book, they see Max. I love that. And I love that. And there's, can you guys find Max here on the cover too? You give a thumbs up if you see the Max. Yeah, I love knowing the personal story behind behind this. It just so makes it extra special. Um, okay, so I have a question for the kids here. So um, give a thumbs up or a thumbs down if you knew that creeks could be hidden before this. Did you know that sometimes creeks could be hidden or covered up? I see some thumbs down. Yeah, me too. I see Connie has her thumb up. <laughs> yep, I see some thumbs up, some thumbs down. I did not know, um, you know, not it wasn't that long ago. I definitely didn't know when I was a kid that creeks could be covered up. Um, and in this case in Iowa, it was covered up by a farmer. He said, you know what, this creek's in my way. I need to farm this land. I'm just gonna, you know, push some dirt over that and I'm gonna use it as a farm. Um, around our area though, do you think creeks can be hidden in our area? Thumbs up if you think they could be hidden. We don't have many farms here where we're living, but they can be hidden. Um, so here's a map of Philadelphia, the one on the left that I'm pointing to. This is historically all the streams that were in Philadelphia. And we, you know, this happens in the suburban counties where we are too, but this is just such a well il illustrated map to show you the idea. Um, you see lots of little streams. You see big, you see the Delaware River over here. You see the Schuylkill River here. 
and those are the big ones. But there's all these little veins kind of things, the smaller creeks. Now over here is today where we still have creeks in Philadelphia that are on the surface, surface creeks that you could walk up and see the water. So what happened to all the creeks? Where did they go? They weren't covered up with farmlands, that's for sure. Because if you go to the city, we what do we see in the city? We see roads, buildings, right? Yeah, so let's see. There's a picture of the city. There's one big, there's the Schuylkill going through the city. That's still there. Amelia, do you want to say something? No? What's that? My dad just said something and I didn't know what it was. Okay. So you can get, you can get. Okay, no problem. All right, so here is the city of Philadelphia. And here in this map, we have the existing streams that we can still see in rivers. But what are all these red lines? If we look back at our old maps, we see some little creeks. Now we have red lines. Those show where sewer pipes were put into the ground and the streams actually flow under the ground in sewer pipes. Um, and that is under our city. And do you think that bugs and birds and trout and frogs can get to the water if it's in a sewer pipe? No. So it's not, it's not very healthy to have, have water flowing that way. Um, and we're actually going to get more into this in another webinar. If for any of the grown-ups that are listening or any interested kids, you're welcome to listen too, but it'll be more geared towards older kids and grown-ups. Um, we're going to have a whole separate webinar on this idea of hidden streams and stream blindness. So if you're interested in this topic, there's so much more to learn. But um, I just wanted to touch on it to let you know that what happened in this book, Creek Finding, you know, it happens here too. It happens everywhere. So um, it's just something to know about. And I'm, I'm glad that you guys are, are lucky enough to know about this as kids, because I certainly didn't know about it. Um, let's see. Do we have any final questions for Jackie before we, I'm trying to scroll through the pictures here to make sure I don't miss anybody. No questions. Okay, Jackie, do you have anything else you want to add about um, maybe what what we could do as as kids and as individuals? I have a couple of things. Um, you know, Mike said our dreams make a difference. The things we do do make a difference. And I certainly can't go out and dig up a lost creek, but I can do some things. I can pick up garbage. I can remember not to throw garbage out my car window when I'm going down the road. And when my grandkids and I go to our favorite state park, we always take a garbage bag. And we pick up if somebody left a can behind or if they left a wrapper, a candy bar wrapper, we pick it up. We have plastic gloves that you know we wear. And it makes me feel so much better to have our beautiful green park green and not littered with cans and wrappers and junk. And I'll tell you something funny. One day we found the lid on a toilet seat. <laughs> Where did that come from? I don't know, but we put it in the garbage. You never know. We The DCVA does annual stream cleanups and you find some really strange things that make it into the water. I know, isn't it strange? Another thing I, I was thinking that might be fun for you, when Claudia and I do school visits, we like to do little art projects with kids. And I think of this kind of like a school visit. This is just a stick. I hope you can see it. It's just like a twig that you might find that blew off a tree. And I think twigs are pretty easy to find. Certainly in my area, after the derecha that we had last week, they're very easy to find. Then find a piece of string or colored yarn, 
tie it on, and then just wrap it around. And if you had more than one color of yarn, you could change the color. But I'm just going to wrap with this yellow because I like yellow. And you see how pretty it gets when you cover it with that yarn. And I have seen people who have like maybe five of these with different colors of yarn. And they put them in a little basket or a little bowl as a way to decorate their house. That's something that is easy to do. It involves the outside and it's, it's fun. And so it's beautiful, it's art. Yeah, and then when you get to the end, cut the string and sort of wrap it back and tuck it in a little bit or put a dot of glue on it so it doesn't unwrap. So some afternoon when you're thinking, what can I do? Think about these string wrap twigs. There are many afternoons like that these days, <laughs> at least in my house. <laughs> yes. Well, I want to thank you, Aurora, for inviting me. I've really enjoyed visiting with these students, and uh, I hope they'll, they will think about Mike and the creek and maybe read the story again. Thank you so much for being with us. I, I appreciate your time and um, all the, the love that you put into this book. Is, it's so apparent. Um, and it's just wonderful. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, there's, there is one question um, in the chat that says, what is the best way to purchase the book that is more beneficial to the author? Is there a way that's better for you? Go to a bookstore. If you a have bookstore. a bookstore, especially an independent bookstore near you, that's the best way. Um, I, I don't even know if the publisher, the University of Minnesota, sells copies. I think they might. I think you might be able to order it online from the University of Minnesota. Okay, great. Thank you. And then there's a few comments here that says, thank you for your passion and work and thank you. So a great big thanks to you. And um, for anyone who's already been to our Youth Naturalist webinars, you know this is a series um, and we continue to host more authors and their books and we hope you'll continue to join us. And um, this is something we do for free for everyone because we want everyone to be able to join us. So that means that DCVA relies on, uh, well, we rely on volunteers. We rely on people donating to our organization. So it's always appreciated when you can do that. But also just sharing this with a friend and telling, you know, maybe a friend wants to join us for the next one. would be great too. So that's all for today. Thank you. Thank Enjoy you. the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye.